The stove is on and the pot is cooking. Welcome to Start the Pots, the show where our takes are colder than New Jersey. I'm here with the executive producer of the No Pulp podcast for Citrus TV, Jish Sokolsky, my guy. You've been here before. How does it feel to be back again? Man, it's an honor. Am I your first two-time guest or? There's been like three or four maybe at the most oh i'm glad to add my name to the uh list of elite sous sous chefs on stir the pot so uh, thanks for having me back of course we ran it for draft day last year and of course we are going to run it back for an even better draft day this year in 2024 because jish i mean let's let's be honest here this is one of if not the best class that we've seen in the last like five years it's a very good class i don't know if i'd call it maybe the best i mean we had the 2021 class with you know jamar chase devon Smith, right. Trevor Lawrence, but it's definitely a really good class. Oh, a yeah. lot of good talent at the top, a lot of good talent in the middle of the draft, and uh, some good depth, too, as you get into the day twos and day threes of this draft. So I'm excited to break it down with you. Definitely, definitely. I mean, and that's the thing is, like, you could see round three, and there's still, like, some gems that, that are available, and it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy in this 2024 class. It happens every year. I think last year I came on this show and said uh, Adebawari, the yeah, uh, defensive yeah, yeah. end for Northwestern, <laughs> he would be a first-round pick. He ended up going in the fourth round to the Colts. So, I, I mean, I love draft season. We all think we know what we're talking about, but at the end of the day, we're all just kind of shooting the crap and, and not really knowing exactly what's going to happen. So that's the, really the beauty of it. It makes for anything better. It, it's better than uh, anything you could write, Ricky. Oh, definitely. I mean, we've seen, like, I think it was one year, I don't remember if it was Colton Miller or no, Clellan Farrell. N- no, I, I'm sorry. A great, great player, but no one expected Clellan Farrell to go, like, what, sixth overall? Uh, fourth overall to the Raiders. Not a great player. Uh, that was a, the, a Mike Mayockism, and he never had a good draft pick when he was with the Raiders, so it, it's the fun, it's the, uh, the storylines, it's, oh my god, who's gonna reach, who's gonna fall? Will Levis fell out of the first round last year. At this time last year, people were saying he could have been the number one overall pick. I think I, I might have even <laughs> propagated that narrative. Didn't, didn't go with it at the end of the day. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> fell out of the first round. So, I mean, there's a lot of smoke going on. There's As we're recording this, we're about two days out from round one. So a lot of the things you hear, don't trust it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Except for this mock draft. This is going to be the right one. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you heard it here from the man himself. If there's any mock draft out there that you should listen to, it's his. So let's not waste any more time beginning with our prize picks results from last week on April 16th. Unfortunately, it's a cruel world out here, ladies and gentlemen. I beat Leon Jacobson 3-1. to one. I don't know how this keeps happening. I don't. I mean, no one intends for these scores to turn out the way that they are, at least not the sous chefs. But, I'm, I mean, I just – do you think that there's anything that, that can be done to bring them back from down 12? Oh, man. Well, it starts with a 3-0 from Jish. Uh, that's, that's what it starts with. We got some playoff basketball. Been doing my homework. I think uh, I'm no better. I want to put that out there right now. I do not gamble. I, I just don't do it. But – Oh, for, hey, and honestly – Neither do I. Because, I mean, wh- wh- why would you, you know... Play yeah, but you, you do this every week. You got a little bit of a home court advantage, but you know me. You know, if you're TD Garden on the Showtime Lakers, let's do it, baby. Oh, for sure. So, let's begin with our first NBA playoff line for today, Tuesday, April 23rd. We have Luka Doncic, 33.5 points versus the Los Angeles Clippers. Again, as we all know, the Clippers, as of recent, have owned the Mavericks when it comes to the playoffs. And so far... They're up 1-0 against them, even though, you know, no Kawhi. Um, I mean, honestly, I'm not going to waste any time. and I'm going to say barely over for Luka because I think that he's going to have that fire lit under him. And especially with, you know, some of the officiating that's been getting questioned around the league as a whole. I'm just, I'm just saying, players are calling into questioning the officials. So, I mean, what if he has that fire lit under him and just goes over? That, that's my pick. It's not just the players. I mean, the Sixers filed a formal complaint against the league about last night's game when Nick Nurse got a timeout ignored and Tyrese Maxey might have been fouled. I don't know if that'll have anything to do with Luka Doncic's performance, but wi- but what will have something to do is Kawhi Leonard was just right before this started recording. He was just uh, deemed eligible to play, wow. so he will will play. Luka Doncic will probably have to take matters into his own hands even more with the wings being locked down. Shoot, they might even throw Kawhi on Luka if they know what's good for them. But I do think Luka Doncic, he had 33 in his last game. The line is 33 and a half. I think he uh, puts his toe over it as well. I think he goes for 40. 
Oh, I completely had to agree just because, I mean, like you said, you think that, and I, that's what I was trying to get across is I do think that he's going to take matters into his own hands and just, you know, decide, you know what, enough playing around. This is my team for a reason. Let's show them why. So. Luca, despite the loss, Doncic. It's a, a, a me, me and my roommates keep doing. It's like, oh, despite the loss, he still did something we haven't seen since Michael Jordan. Like, <laughs> he'll, he'll drop 39, 16, and 7 and still lose 101 to 96. So, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it, it's unfortunate because, you know, we have seen that so many times in the past, whether it's in the postseason or even in regular season games. So, We'll see what Luka Doncic does tonight on Tuesday against the Clippers. And now our second line is going to be the league's leading assister, Tyrese Halliburton, 10.5 assists versus the Milwaukee Bucks. Again, this is one of those series where there is a consensus favorite. And so far, again, Damian Lillard has shown why. And he told the fans during the game, this is why you have me here. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I like Damian Lillard. I don't like the Bucks. I'm a Bulls fan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tyrese Halliburton, my roommate's a Pacers fan. I've watched a lot of Tyrese Halliburton this year. Yeah. That guy's different. Oh, yeah, he's him. That guy's different. He just finds open dudes. He'll pass up an open shop to find an open guy. I don't know about Giannis's status for this game, but if I think he's trending towards playing. But even if he, uh, even if he does play, I think that... Tyrese Halliburton is an assister first before he's a scorer. I want to. We still really haven't seen Tyrese Halliburton in the meat and potatoes of the playoffs. Maybe he's not a playoff guy, but I, I like what I've seen from Halliburton all season. I think this ten and a half line is pretty low. I like Halliburton for twelve assists, and I think that uh, the Pacers steal game too. Too. Well, I mean, like I said, the league's leading assist are averaging somewhere around eleven and a half assists per game. So that is a completely justifiable line, especially. When it matters most in the playoffs, when everybody, as we all know, is zero and zero until you win a series. So let's see how Tyrese Halliburton performs tonight against the Milwaukee Bucks. And now our final line is coming from the game we mentioned earlier between the Mavericks and the Clippers because it's Paul George, four and a half three pointers made against the Mavericks. Paul George, you know, I mean, th there is such a. I won't call it a what if around his career, but I will just say. Everybody has, I mean, the NBA fans have their own narrative around every player, but especially with him, I mean, there's just, I feel like there's so many more compared to other players. I, I love Paul George. I think he's yeah. a ring away from being considered a Hall of Famer, if we're being completely honest. But I think that four and a half three pointers as his line, that's a little high. That's oh, a little yeah. generous. When it comes to threes, yeah. There's one ball in Los Angeles. I think that's going to go to James Harden, who just had a tear against the Mavericks. That's going to go to Russell Westbrook, who is starting to find his shooting stroke. Kawhi Leonard's back. I don't think playoff P is going to be <laughs> shooting as many. And if he does... <laughs> It's going to be because he's forcing him, and I don't think he has to shoot as many. I think he knows his role in this team. I think he'll be more of an assister, more of a 3 and D kind of guy, maybe a little less 3, a little more D. Uh, and I think Paul George doesn't score more than four and a half three pointers. That's a, a pretty generous mark for him. I'll agree with you, especially when you're playing on a team with so many, you know, just all-stars on one team. I mean, like you said, Kawhi, Paul George, James Harden, Russell Westbrook. I mean, it, Super honestly, team five years ago. Oh, for sure. Th th this would have been the team of the NBA five years ago. But, I mean, the craziest part is I just I, – I really cannot help but feel like this is their last chance yeah. to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. Before rebuild time. I, I agree 100%. I like some of the young talent that they do have, but – Trading for James Harden this season, you're yeah. going all in. And we saw them get really hot in January and February. Right. They've cooled off a little bit. They have a chance to find their footing against the Mavs, who are one of the hottest teams in the league. It's really a matter of can the Mavericks supporting cast step up? Can Derek Jones Jr., can Derek Lively, can right. Josh Green, these kind of young, inexperienced players how are they going to meet the moment right now? And if they can meet the moment, then we might be sending the Clippers off to the sunset. Oh, I mean, that's what, again, because according to the experts, or even the betting books, some of them at least, the Mavericks were actually favored to win this series over the Los Angeles Clippers just because of, like you said, that young, gritty core that they have right now. So we'll see if they can get it done against the Los Angeles Clippers. And, I mean, th the playoffs are just such a, an interesting time of the year because, I mean, 
Obviously, when it comes to overall ratings, you know, we've seen the rise of college basketball, you know, start to overtake some of the NBA games. And I'm, I, 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 don't forget about women's basketball. That's what I'm saying. It could, college basketball as a whole, especially the women. I think the WNBA is about to have one of its best years oh, of all time, and I don't sure. see it slowing down anytime soon. For sure. They'll most likely be setting some revenue records. And I mean, I mean, I mean and we just actually got the headline earlier that I want to say it was the Wings that just got... All of their season tickets sold out. They're, they're sold out of season tickets. Wow, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens to the Aces too, because they're they did, you know yeah, they back-to-back did. champions. You know, yeah. just got DH Affair yeah. and Liz Shout Kitley. Out. Shout out. The Fever obviously are going to be oh, packing their oh, they're, arena. They're, 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 they're done. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a rapture league. I feel like the Chicago Sky has always had a very right. good fan base in Chicago too. They got a lot of supporters Twin Towers in Chicago now. Uh huh. You're you, you're right about that. They got Angel Reese and Camilo Cardoso That's in the crazy. draft. What a fast rebuild that'll be. That's I mean, shoot, they just won the championship two years ago. <laughs> Goodbye, uh, Ken. Uh, Candace Parker, yeah. hello, the Twin Towers. Yeah, it's like, oh man, I'm, it's it's going to be a lot of fun to track the WNBA this league this year. But I, I think that uh, there's still a lot of NBA playoffs still left to play before we can start talking about the WNBA. That's what I'm saying. But nonetheless, and after we saw the electric series that was the Liberty and the Aces last year, it's going to be a very interesting 2024 season for the WNBA. But like just just said, we got to recap some of the NBA playoffs because we're going to get into some of the series that are going to be occurring tonight on Thursday when this podcast is released, starting with Knicks versus Sixers, arguably the most controversial series of this entire playoffs because like the aforementioned officiating that we talked about earlier and I mean two crazy games and just last night alone, what a doubleheader. It's funny, Ricky. People always come up to me and ask, oh, what about the Sixers game? They think I'm a Sixers fan because I'm an Eagles fan. No, but <laughs> even though I'm not a Sixers fan, right. man, what a horrible job by the officials, dude. I mean, I watched back the clip so many times. Yeah, he fouled. clearly got fouled. Fouled. fouled two times, as the league did yeah. find in their memos today that they put out. And you see Nick Nurse calling a timeout. You don't do it. I think blaming the refs is super weak. But at that moment, if you're a referee— you have to understand what's about to happen. The Knicks were obviously going to play a lot more aggressive, intentional foul. The play like kind of stopped after Maxi lost the ball. Everyone just yeah. assumed there was a yeah. foul. Yeah, because that's what's supposed to happen. If you're an official, recognize yeah. that. What are we doing? B- blow the whistle. <laughs> I, I mean, because I just, I, yeah, like you said, you know, I watched the play back, and they were swarming him, like not just you know, like like hands off, but they were literally swarming him. And I mean, there was all kinds of physical contact. So obviously, very controversial decision at the end of the Knicks and Sixers game. <laughs> the Eagles lost the Super Bowl for a hold like that. I'm telling you, I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen it. So I mean, two Philadelphia teams have now gotten wins taken from them from unfortunate circumstances. Oh so. Greece. Yeah, and I mean, it, who, who, we'll see if things get better. We'll see if the Sixers can make a comeback because they are down 2-0 to the New York Knicks. So They're going to play ticked off in Game 3. Oh, 1,000%. I, I, I fully expect the Sixers to have some some built-up rage in them and just letting it out. And, you, you know, Joel Embiid, 45-piece. Why not? I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm just saying why not? Nick Batum, 33. <laughs> book it right now. That's why you have Batum in. So we'll Fourth see. Fourth quarter yelling why Batum in. <laughs> so we'll see how the Knicks and Sixers play out this series. So New York, obviously, up 2-0. Our next series here, Cavaliers versus the Magic. Ah, we can skip this one. No, I'm just playing. I mean, I, well, no, honestly, <laughs> I, I was going to keep it short and sweet because this is kind of going how everybody expected. But, I mean, the Magic, I, I, I know you're young, but come on. They're not ready yet. They're playing. Oh, yeah. This series reminds me of like an '80s or '90s <laughs> scrap. <laughs> the Magic haven't scored more than 90 points in the playoffs against the Cavs, which you know they're a good defensive team, a really good defensive front court with Mobley and Allen. But this team just still needs some time to marinate. You know, Jalen Suggs getting some unfortunate injuries that that you know obviously is going to set you back. He's a big piece of that young core. But the Magic took a big leap this year, and when you add another year of Paolo Banquero, when you add another year of Franz Wagner and, you know, Wendell Carter kind of becoming more and more of a solidified anchor of that defense. 
you're going to start to see even more success from the Magic. I think they will be back. I don't think this is a situation where, oh, they peaked too soon and now they're on the decline. I think they still got a very bright future, but man, oh man, it's been very bad basketball, Ricky. Yeah, it's been really unfortunate for this young core like you just talked about. And I mean, that that big four, that big three that you just talked about, I mean, that is a really solid group of guys that you have there that you can, that, that you can build around. So I also believe that the Magic will be back in the playoffs next year. As the top six seed will have to be seen, but nonetheless, we both think the Magic are going to be back here. So that's that series. Cavaliers are up 2-0, and the other team that's up 2-0, all sweeps here so far, is the Denver Nuggets, who, who won their 10th straight game against the Los Angeles Lakers after Jamal Murray with the fadeaway from the corner mid-range over Anthony Davis, I mean, first we had AD in Game 2 of the 2020 Western Conference Finals in the bubble, hitting the shot over Nikola Jokic, and then we saw Nikola with the dagger over AD in last year's playoffs, and now we see Jamal Murray win the game over AD in this. I mean, this is turning into quite the rivalry. We, we got to talk about how the Lakers were up 20. Oh, yeah. I was looking at the box score of that game, like, halfway through. Okay, it's done. There's no way. It's a 1-1 series. Hell. It's going to be great came back I, I just don't know what it is the Nuggets always own the Lakers and you talk about that Jamal Murray shot you know it's as automatic as like a two-foot putt for oh, him yeah. he, oh, he yeah. the handoff run all the way down baseline <laughs> moving to doesn't matter if you have one of the best defenders of all time in your face you're just draining that if you're Jamal Murray and he did Anthony Davis after the game couldn't even say anything about it he made the shot that's it that's really all it is. The Nuggets are going to they're going to win this series again. It's there's no doubt in my mind about it. They're just too good, too deep. Nikola Jokic is out of he's one of the all-time greats oh, already yeah. oh, with yeah. an all-time great supporting cast too. Michael Porter Jr. is bringing, you know, <laughs> the only bit of uh, pride to that family name, let's Never just say. Never pass the rock. <laughs> Never pass the rock. Michael Pullett Jr., Michael Caitlin Clark Pullett Jr. Uh I, I mean, you have a great supporting cast around Jokic. This is a team that could run it back and win the whole thing again. I'm I'm very convinced of that. Oh, 1000%. We just saw Yukon become Tukon. So now we could see the Nuggets become their own version of Tucon. So Tunver, Denver, Tunver, the Denver Doubles, the Double Nuggets. I don't know. You guys decide that nickname if the Denver Nuggets manage to go back to back and win the NBA championship, which would be the first since the Golden State Warriors, actually. Which you know, it, it seems like it just happened, but in reality, it was. What like seven that's like years half ago, a right? century ago, wow. or not century? Well, half, half a decade. decade. <laughs> oh, oh man, not that long ago. Hey, it's all good, but I know what you mean. But nonetheless, we'll see if the Nuggets can pull it off. I certainly think that they have all the tools to do so. So the Nuggets obviously on a very good start to their playoff run, and they now lead two zero over the Los Angeles Lakers. That is going to recap our NBA playoffs recap from this weekend, and now. That's going to be our brief headline for this episode. But the main, the main entree that everybody wants to know is what is Jish Sokolsky's NFL mock draft looking like this year? And ladies and gentlemen, I must say he is cooking. He is cooking up a draft that he claims is the one that you should listen to. So with that being said, let's now get into Jish Sokolsky's NFL mock draft for 2024. Like we talked about Probably the best class since like 2021. So many QBs, so many receivers. Even overall, the defensive side of the ball is very, very good this year, right? Right. I mean, you, you talk about the quarterback's defense. I'm looking at this offensive line. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So many quality offensive linemen that are for the taking in this draft. You're not going to go wrong. There's like five very quality potential future Pro Bowl tackles that can be taken in this first round. I'm very excited to uh, show you where they land. Definitely. So... We'll see what has we'll see what has to happen with the O line in this mock draft for Jish here. But nonetheless, the question that everybody has number one overall. Let's analyze the situation here. Bears got this pick from Carolina, which I mean th that whole trade as a whole has just turned out to be probably what a stinker. Probably the Panthers' worst nightmare at the moment. Um, you know, I legitimately still don't know how they you know pulled that trade off. I know that they were you know really want to get that number one overall pick, 
but you ended up picking the wrong guy. At least for right now. For right now. For for right now. Yeah. We, we 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 need we need like two more years. But for right now, I mean th- th- that being said, you know, uh, I I still don't know why the Bears didn't just keep Fields, get Marvin number one, and O line at nine. I I th- th- that seemed like the best solution. I'm not the best, but the safest solution possible. I don't know about that. I feel like Justin Fields is so overhyped. I well, I, I mean, yes, he hasn't had the best start to a career. Obviously, it's it's not just like the best start. It's like he. He tricks fan bases every year. He did this to the Bears last season, too, where he is the worst quarterback in the league for the first 10 games of the year, completely wipes the Bears' chances of doing anything, eliminates them from the playoffs prematurely, and then goes on a tear in the final six games. And fans say, oh, but oh, but Justin Fields, he can do this. Oh, my God, I want him on my team next year. I want him to do this. That, the Bears fell for that trick last year, and I don't blame them for it, but fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. Or fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. It's shame on me. Yeah. So they're not going to get burned again by Justin Fields. Even though we had a very impressive back half of the season, why couldn't you do that in a full season with DJ Moore? So... I like the direction that Ryan Poles and the Bears went with this offseason. They cut their losses. They bring in Keenan Allen. They're oh, building yeah. a team that is perfectly fit for a young quarterback to grow and develop in. And it gives them kind of a layering when it comes to how they're going to build the team for the future. They have a pretty young O-line, an older receiving core with Keenan Allen. But if you have that young quarterback that comes in and can right. learn from them, then yeah. you can start building around the young quarterback after you've already kind of put the foundational pieces in. So this draft right now is where you get your guy. It's, it's going to be Caleb Williams. Right. I, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm not going to go too far against the grain. Oh, Spencer Rattler, number one overall. <laughs> um, but no, it's going to be Caleb Williams. He's going to come. It, he's like already negotiating with the Bears about like different things. So it's going to be him he has a very good system to go into I think he's going to a team dinner with like Cole Komet and Jalen Johnson that's another great thing the Bears did this offseason locking down Jalen Johnson their lockdown corner right he's going to be instrumental for this defense moving forward they got a very young secondary with Brisker Kyler Gordon as well they need a little bit of help on that pass rush but other than that they have a very young and talented promising core on defense and then a more like set in stone we're gonna help you you young buck out uh in your first years in Chicago on off definitely and you know like you just said you know when you have Keenan Allen not only can he provide you know I mean DJ Moore is quite a few years younger than Keenan Allen so Keenan Allen can obviously provide his veteran wisdom to not only DJ Moore but depending on what they do at nine a new receiver so we'll see what happens when the Bears as Jish Sokolsky in his mock draft just said will be drafting arguably the greatest college quarterback that we've ever seen play in the in I mean just in the game in general I mean th- this guy was electric and his name of course is Caleb Williams coming out of USC going number one overall to the Chicago Bears which I mean this is essentially – it's supposed to be their guy. It's supposed to be their, their guy going forward, and they've built this roster for him like you just talked about. So Caleb Williams going number one overall to the Chicago Bears. And now, Jish, we got to talk about some of the other QBs from this class because presumably are you going to go back-to-back-to-back to back to back QBs in this draft? Well, I think well, – let's start with Washington. I think that they've made it very clear that they're taking quarterback at number two. Um, they've showed no interest in trading out of the pick um, from everything they've indicated. Although that, could, that could be smoky, just you know, get other teams to sweat and panic a little bit. But I do believe they're going to stay put and take a quarterback. And the hire of Cliff Kingsbury does intrigue me. Right. That makes me believe, okay, you want a kind of more mobile quarterback who can you know improvise, and that's kind of his strong suit. So that – Kind of pushes me towards Jaden Daniels, the quarterback from LSU. Okay. But Drake May is the better quarterback. Yeah. Drake May from UNC is... He can make any throw you ask him to. He plays with so much poise, and people act like he isn't some improviser or some playmaker. Oh, I've I've seen it. This this dude against Pittsburgh this year rolled out left and threw it with his left hand. Like, if if Caleb Williams wasn't here, Drake May would be talked about as a generational talent. Oh, yeah. Drake May, he's seen as, like, this steady prospect, and in some senses, yes, he is. But he also has proven time and time again to create out of structure. Yeah. And Cliff Kingsbury, yeah, he has Kyler Murray that people know him for, but he also had Patrick Mahomes and Baker Mayfield. And I think that kind of strong-armed, accurate quarterback that isn't five foot eleven is the kind of quarterback that Cliff Kingsbury can thrive with and really start to reinvent himself with. You know, you also look at some of these commanders' offseason moves as well, bringing in Zach Ertz, Austin Eckler— 
you you want like kind of safer targets for your quarterback to right. hit. Right. Jaden Daniels is kind of more of that vertical field stretcher. He's the big play kind of guy, and you don't necessarily have that big play threat like Terry McLaurin, sure, maybe Jahan Dotson, whatever, every once in a while. Right. But you don't have a really like fast playmaker on your team. I think that this team is. Again, it, the the commanders built a good infrastructure around Drake May right. to come in and thrive. And I think he'll, out of the gate, just like C.J. Stroud last year, he'll probably be a little more successful than Caleb Williams year one. Ooh, really? I do think that. Okay. I, I think Caleb Williams will be fine, but if he isn't fine, right. he's going to fall off a cliff. Oh, for right? sure. The game speed is a lot different. Caleb Williams, it, it, he's he's incredible for going back to him. Makes so many plays out of structure. The, his timing, his feel for the game is unmatched. Drake May can work within without a system, and I think that Cliff Kingsbury is a quarterback whisperer, at least early on before he gets figured out, which will eventually happen. <laughs> but Drake May, I think, will have immediate success, just as Kyler Murray did with Cliff Kingsbury. He's very quarterback friendly in year one. Okay, so Drake May, also my number two quarterback in this class, is going to go number two overall to the Washington Commanders, who, like we just talked about, they got rid of Sam Howell, you know, but they need a quarterback now, and apparently that guy, according to Jish, is Drake May, so let's see if he can be the Commanders guy of the future, and now we have the Patriots here, who could go Jaden Daniels, however... There's a guy by the name of Marvin Harrison that they could also go with. So, from here, shifting from, you know, Patriots who need a receiver, Cardinals need a receiver, Chargers, all these teams that need receivers, run me through these picks. Uh, oh, we're, we're going quick. Okay, well, the Patriots, you know, they, they're only, like, competent quarterback on the roster right now is Jacoby Brissett. And right. if you're a new head coach, go, and you're Gerard Mayo going into your new regime, you don't want... <laughs> Jacoby Brissett <laughs> to be the face of your franchise. Great backup quarterback. Great backup quarterback. Don't get me wrong, but the Patriots on the other end haven't really done a lot this offseason to build up that offense. Right. And they kind of will need a quarterback that's going to be their offense. And that's what Jaden Daniels can be. And this would be the, the first at least his type of quarterback from the Patriots in, in quite a while. I mean, I, they haven't had those kind of dynamic quarterbacks in a while. Yeah, I mean, you know, Cam Newton was way past his prime when right. they had him, obviously, but that would be like kind of the idea, right? You, you're you a team that's predicated on running the ball. Some of the, the moves they made, like re-signing Onwenu this offseason, makes me believe that this is a team that might, like, you know, go a little bit more ground and pound as they have done. They don't really have tons of weapons. They they locked up their tight ends, um, and Demario Douglas had a very prominent promising rookie year, but Jaden Daniels is the type of quarterback who can break off a 60-yard run and can be that offensive spark. Honestly, I think if the commanders did go Jaden Daniels, the Patriots might trade out of this pick so somebody else could take Drake May, but I think Jaden Daniels does work really well with the Patriots. He doesn't necessarily fit like what you've seen in Patriots quarterbacks in the past, Mac Jones and Tom Brady, the... the Bailey Zappi, even. And Bailey Zappi, they don't move like Jaden Daniels, but Jaden <laughs> Daniels has the same kind of mental fortitude for the game. He makes great decisions, doesn't throw picks, has tremendous numbers, tremendous arm talent. It's, you know, sometimes the layups aren't there for him, but that's something that you'll learn in the NFL. It makes him worthy of a top three pick. His talent is off the charts, Ricky. De oh, definitely. I mean, and essentially... What you're banking on, at least from my eyes, when you get a guy like this, is kind of, I mean, I don't think he's, I mean, he's definitely similar to Lamar Jackson, but from, in a, in a broad term, Lamar 2.0. So, we'll see what happens when the Patriots pick three, third overall, and now we got the Cardinals, Chargers, and Giants, who, again, I mean, these teams could go many different directions. They could go receiver. They could go O-line. They could trade out if they wanted to, depending on how they're feeling with the prospects at this point. But do you have any idea, you know, what these teams should do? Because, I mean, we've seen some mock drafts that have the Vikings trading up, Broncos trading up. You never know. Well, Ricky, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned trade up. I actually just closed out of my mock draft, so I don't have this, but I remember what I did here. The Cardinals currently have the fourth overall pick. Marvin Harrison Jr. is right there. It's a no-brainer, right? Unless, unless a team like the Minnesota Vikings comes oh! along. Unless a team like the Minnesota Vikings, who's, they got Sam Darnold on roster. He's technically projected to be their, their number one guy. J.J. McCarthy is a guy that's getting a lot of smoke blown 
his way. You know, you got the Raiders head coach saying he's a born winner. This is a guy who's going to come in and win. Obviously, Jim Harbaugh, the Chargers coach, is saying this is a guy who's going to win you football games. He won them a national championship. So, I mean, you want a guy like that on your team. I don't think J.J. McCarthy has necessarily everything you need to see from him on tape, but the arm strength, the mobility, it's something you want to bet on. And I think the Vikings are still kind of in a win-now mode with some of the moves they made on offense. They still have to pay, or on defense, rather. But they still have to pay Justin Jefferson, but there's no better situation for a rookie quarterback to go in than to throw to TJ Hawkinson, Justin Jefferson, and Jordan Addison coming in. If J.J. McCarthy's going to have a shot in this league, it's because he gets to throw to those three guys, and uh, he, he should be very excited that the Vikings went up and grabbed him. They do have to give up both of their first-round picks in the process to Arizona and a first rounder next year is thrown in in that deal as well. But I think that when you see your guy and you know they're flying off the board, you got the Giants right there, probably also hitting up Arizona's line. You got to be aggressive. You got to throw in your, you got to hedge your bets, go after it and get your guy. That's what Minnesota did. They get JJ McCarthy. Wow. Wow. What a pick. I, I mean, I understand it. I, I do, but I don't, but I do, but I don't. You get me? Like, I, I get you. <laughs> like, it, it's it, it's one of those things where, you know, I can live with it. I can live without it. Um, Yeah, Vikings need a quarterback. I get it. But now that that has happened and that Marvin Harrison is still on the board, does Jim Harbaugh finesse the NFL and get Marvin Harrison at five with a steal to give Justin Herbert what a, 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 an insane target to throw to, to throw to. Ricky, I gotta ask you. What's, well, first, what's the alternative to JJ McCarthy going into the year with Sam Darnold as your starting quarterback if you're the Vikings? I mean, there's other QBs in the class though. <laughs> yeah, you really want to wait? You get a Bo Nix at eleven. You get a, Mi- uh, yeah, a Michael Penix like. I just don't – I'd rather you go up, you get your guy who is testing phenomenally, who's interviewing phenomenally. This guy just screams franchise quarterback. I could be wrong. I mean, like, I don't necessarily right. believe the hype. Like, last year, Will Levis was getting all this hype thrown at him. He fell out of the first round like we kind of talked about. I think the same thing could happen to J.J. McCarthy, but if he doesn't, this is what's going to happen. I mean, again, like I said, I completely understand – the motivation here, right? Because my whole thing with McCarthy is just like when you're drafting him, it's like I don't want to say he's safe, but it's just that you you know what you're getting and you're not going with the upside pick. I feel like there is a little bit of upside to McCarthy that people just aren't talking about. Uh, his, his rushing ability is beyond slept on. I think that his skill set, it needs a little refinement. I still need to see him make way more touch passes and kind of make the layups that he hasn't really hit and s- show that he can perform in a system where it isn't all like a running running back style, but he'll go into a great system with a great coaching staff, a great offensive coaching staff with Kevin O'Connell at the helm. I think that this is a, a perfect marriage. You see your guy, you know, other people want your guy, you go get your guy. It, it doesn't matter how much it costs, you move up in the draft, you take him. And that's why the Vikings really accrued those picks anyway. You really think they were going to do that without trying to go for one of those top four quarterbacks? Right, right, of course, and I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I mean, as much as, you know, I may not be a McCarthy guy, as, as far as a prospect in this class level, but on an overall level and a fit level, I do have to agree with you. That'd be a very nice pick for the Vikings to get at four overall from the Arizona Cardinals, and now, like we just talked about earlier, that, there's, that still leaves arguably the best wide receiver prospect since Jamar Chase, essentially. I mean, does Marvin Harrison go number five, or does somebody else go number I mean, I've seen some mock drafts that have Joe Alt going number five overall to the Chargers. Right. Well, you said the Chargers, right? You said the Chargers? Yeah. You, you think the Chargers are going to pick at number five? I mean, but I, <laughs> Hang on, Ricky. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't blame you. I feel like, yeah, you're, you're there at five. There's a lot of top-end talent. Why not? The reason why not is because there's the top-end talent. All right, who's going to give me the most capital to come up and take Marvin Harrison Jr.? I think the Chargers are a team that's going to be committed to the run the next year. They traded away Keenan Allen. They let go of Mike Williams. They don't have any receivers. But they brought in both Ravens running backs. I think this is a team that... You know, they could take Joe Alt here to really build the trenches, but 
I don't think that this is the value they want for Joe Alt. So I think they're looking back and, hey, remember a team called the Arizona Cardinals that just traded oh! number four? You pick up an extra first round this year. You pick up an extra first round next year. You actually pick up two extra first rounders this year. You trade one of the first rounders next year. To move up, that's all it's going to take. It's going to take 27, and it's going to take 11 for the Cardinals to move back up into the top five where they're going to take Marvin Harrison. This is exactly what they did last year to take Paris Johnson Jr. You move down from number three, back up to six. You still get your guy. The Cardinals are a team that plays ticky-tack. They're going to get their capital, but then they're still going to attack. I love that from the Arizona Cardinals. I think it would be an awesome move for them, and it's, it's the kind of move that you'd see on draft night. It's what we saw last year, really. Like you just said, that is an awesome strategy. You draft back, go back up, get your. It, that, that is just you, you're like boom, 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 boom. I mean, just type beat. Uh, that's all I'm saying is, I mean, what what a strategy from the Arizona Cardinals, man. I, I love the movie Draft Day. This is the kind of thing that uh, Kevin Costner's character would do. So oh, I, I, sure. I, I channeled my inner. What would a uh, Sonny Weaver Jr. do? So that's exactly what he would do. Marvin Harrison Jr. still an Arizona Cardinal, so you can sleep at night, Ricky. Wow. So Cardinals, after all this. Only move back one spot, still get Marvin Harrison Jr. at number five. So we'll see what happens when essentially Marvin Harrison goes to the Cardinals. I mean, I, I do still think that, you know, wh whether or not this happens, I, for some reason, just I, I do think that Marvin Harrison Jr. does end up on the Cardinals somehow, some way in this draft, you know, essentially becoming the team's new Larry Fitzgerald. So we'll see what happens when. NFL Draft Day kicks off this Thursday, and now we have to go to our sixth pick of the draft, which right now is owned by another team that could get Joe Alt if they really needed to, that being the New York Giants. Uh, but they won't, though. I think the Giants are in the worst predicament in the league right now with Daniel Jones on a horrible contract. You know you bring in Drew Locke. He's not going to replace Daniel Jones, but... I think what you need to do with this year's draft is to kind of make this place more suitable for whoever you bring in after Daniel Jones. You have to plan for life after Daniel Jones with this draft, whether that is trading up into the top five to get a quarterback, which I don't have them doing. I just think they get outbid. I don't think they have the capital to make that monumental move because they'd probably have to move into the top three, and I don't think they can do that to get one of their guys. So... There's another very talented receiver in this draft who, again, if there wasn't a guy named Marvin Harrison Jr., would probably be your wide receiver one. He reminds me a lot of Odell Beckham from the same school, similar body type. It's Malik Neighbors. Ooh, yeah, so, oh, yeah. so the Giants can have a one-two punch with Darren Waller if he does decide to return. I mean, and you see, that's the thing when it comes to this receiver's class. And, I mean, obviously, you know, realistically, the majority of NFL fans— have Marvin as their number one wide receiver, but there's still that portion that is preferring Malik Neighbors. I, I mean, it's that's it's silly to me. I mean, I, I I understand because I mean Marvin bigger, you know, just as fast, you know, better hands, and I mean, obviously Marvin Harrison Jr. should be at least if you watch the if you watch the games the better receiver than Malik Neighbors. But I feel like anybody that prefers Malik Neighbors just prefers. You know, just the overall more like the overall faster guy that can run those like 15 yard routes. Like just like basically if you run like a, a running gun style offense, you get Malik Neighbors. Of course. No, Malik Neighbors is one of the best like stackers in the draft. He's good at getting his, the corners confused and making explosive breaks and plays on the field. It's a big reason why Jaden Daniels threw for 48 touchdowns this year. A lot of them went to uh, Malik Neighbors down in, uh, down, down in Baton Rouge. Oh, for sure. Him and Brian Thomas were absolutely the one-two punch of the nation this year so the Giants uh, he, the Giants with this pick going with Malik Neighbors in Jish Sokolsky's mock draft obviously a very smart pick would be a heck of a target for Daniel Jones next year and now the Titans the third straight team that could take Joe Alt they need offensive line everybody knows this do they make it happen they do make it happen, and I think it's a little silly that they've telegraphed it this much. Hey, we need it, a top-tier offensive lineman, but they're fortunate in the Jish Sikorsky mock draft that it fell this way. Joe Alt becomes a Titan at pick seven, but there are plenty of teams that could definitely move up in front of them and snag him. The The Titans just cut Andre Dillard this offseason. They got Skaronsky last draft. He's going to move to guard, or he's, he's moved to guard. That's probably where he'll play for his career. 
Get yourself a true franchise left tackle. You have some good pieces in place. You have an investment in Will Levis, and you can really only see if that works by surrounding him with talent. They bring in Calvin Ridley. They still have DeAndre Hopkins. They're squeezing every last drop of his career out in Tennessee. Will Levis just needs time to throw, and they also need time to get Tony Pollard some rushing lanes. And Joe Alt's going to do both. He's a big, physical, imposing, whatever adjective, a mauler, a grizzly bear of a left tackle. He's the kind of guy you like building your franchise around the Titans have done it numerous times you look at Michael Ruse in the past Taylor Laron Jack Conklin all great tight tight uh Titans O linemen that have been key contributors to successful Titans teams so this is a team that knows to build in the trenches they just got an offensive minded head coach to right the ship the rest of the way and Joe Alt is a big uh you build in the trenches, and there's no better way to build in the trenches than with the best tackle in this year's draft. Oh, definitely. I mean, Joe Alt, one of the most talented tackles that we've seen in recent memory. And, I, I mean, you, you just mentioned it. When in doubt, fortify your trenches on both sides of the field. You know, I mean, the, the, the game is played in the trenches. The game is played all over the field. But most importantly, arguably, that is, most importantly, the game is played in the trenches. So the Titans go with Joe Alt at number seven overall. And now we switch over to the Atlanta Falcons, who are in their own kind of okay. We have our we have our quarterback for the immediate future, but probably need to start thinking about what's going to happen after this immediate future. So, with that being said, obviously a lot of you know scouts and prospects are saying that you know they could go edge, they could go you know I mean even though they're probably not going to go O line, they could go O line if they wanted to. However, that being said. I mean, I, I've seen a whole lot of drafts that have the Falcons going with edge. So do you have them going with edge or not? Well, the thing about the draft is it's a game of checkers, or, or chess, rather, while everyone else is playing checkers, right? Right. The Falcons could take the first defensive player off the board here. But there's a special, special wide receiver that's sitting there that they don't necessarily need. They don't really need him. But you know who desperately needs a wide receiver? The Los Angeles Chargers oh, yeah. sitting now at pick 11. This pick has been passed wow. around three times, make it a fourth time. So the Chargers, the Chargers, the Chargers don't have to give up their second first round pick, but they go back to the, you, you still can't ignore Justin Herbert. If you move back, move up, you're still getting the same kind of Cardinals value. You're still getting the, the wide receiver three in this draft, Roma Dunze is probably the number one wide receiver in plenty of other drafts. He's big, he's physical, he's what Quinton Johnson should have been, and now they can form a great vertical one-two punch, boss anybody down the field for Justin Herbert to really complement the rushing attack they're going to try and establish in Los Angeles. So Justin Herbert gets his guy in Rome Adunze, and the Chargers offense is retooling for the future. Oh, most definitely. I mean, like you mentioned it, you can't just leave Justin Herbert with nobody because that'll only make things worse than they already are. So the Chargers go with Romo Dunze. And now rounding out the top 10, we have the Bears here at pick nine, which, you know, a lot of, again, mock drafts had them going whatever the best available receiver was at this point. But now that those big three are gone, what happens here? Exactly. You know, a lot of mock drafts do think the Bears need that receiver, but what the Bears really need is mid-round picks. The Bears have four picks in this year's draft, so they are calling everybody behind them. Hey, you want this guy? Hey, you want this guy? Hey, you want this guy? And the person that picks up the phone is the New Orleans Saints wow. at pick 14. They're moving up into the top 10 because they have a desperate absolutely catastrophic need for a tackle. They took Trevor Penning two years ago. It's not going to work. It wasn't. I said it at the time, and I'm saying it now. Trevor Penning, he's not ready for the NFL. He can maybe put in the guard, maybe have a, a salvageable career, but he's not at tackle. So the Saints move up. They trade a, a handful of mid-round picks so the Bears can build around Caleb Williams some more, and they're taking Olu Fashinu, the Penn, the Penn State offensive tackle, to really shore up that line, give Derek Carr some cleaner pockets and try to compete in the NFC South, which is seeming more and more like the Falcons' division to lose. Oh, most definitely. I mean, you know, and I mean, that, that's a great pick that you just made there, Olu Fashanu. I mean, last year it was argued that you know if he was, in which I mean he was eligible, he was eligible for that class, but if he had went in, he could have been like a top five pick. He could have been the number one overall pick. But unfortunately, since then, his stock has ever so slightly, not, not a whole lot, but ever so slightly declined. He definitely could take a slide. You know, I, I, I don't know 
when you see slides, they're usually for a reason. I'm not quite sure what NFL teams don't see in him, but he's huge. He's a mauler in the pass block game. His run blocking game will get there. But this is a Saints team that does like to pass the ball, to get to get it to their weapons, to Chris Olave and Alvin Kamara. So you want to give Derek Carr some time so he doesn't end up like his brother David, who gets who got sacked all the time. You, you get Olu Fushanu, throw in a bunch of fourth and fifth rounders. The Bears are happy. The Saints are happy. They leapfrog the Jets, who also could have taken a tackle for the future. And you, I think both sides win this deal, and Olu Fushanu is headed down to New Orleans. I mean, and I mean to, to say the least. I mean, as part of his job, he does have to eat quite a lot. But now, even in the city of New Orleans, he's going to get some even better food. He's going to he's going to get some even better food on the Saints in Jish Sikorsky's mock draft. So that is going to be the New Orleans Saints pick. But now we're rounding out the top ten with the New York Jets, who are in quite an interesting position here. Yeah, I, I love their offseason because the owner Woody Johnson said, "Hey, my coach and GM are pl- are are." are playing for their jobs right now, and that lit a fire under Sala and Joe Douglas. They went out and they got Hassan Reddick. They went out and they got Mike Williams. They're getting Aaron Rodgers some help. The Jets have to compete in 2024, so they're going to go with the most electric tight end we've seen since Kyle Pitts. Brock Bowers, welcome to New York City. You're the latest New York Jet. They let go of both CJ Uzama and Tyler Conklin this offseason. They have a need at tight end. Brock Bowers is a playmaker. You can line him up at tight end. You can line him up as a slot receiver. We know that Aaron Rodgers can make tight ends dangerous. Imagine what he could do with the best tight end in college football. It's a scary sight thinking about what that Jets offense is going to be next year. We know about their defense with Sauce Gardner, now Hassan Reddick, and the, the like of them. Some underrated pieces there. But now that offense is going to be unstoppable if Aaron Rodgers comes back as he was and the Jets are going to look to compete in 2024. So Robert Sala and Joe Douglas have jobs in the New York organization in 2025. <laughs> Most definitely, the Jets are definitely in that kind of a position. They're where... tired of rebuilding. They got to go for it oh, now. Yeah. Oh, for, for sure. I mean, there is there's absolutely no excuses now. They need Aaron Rodgers to come back healthier than ever. And I mean, like you mentioned, what a weapon. Brock Bowers, another guy that if it wasn't for this stacked of a class, could have been like a top five pick if you say... I mean, if, if you're feeling that way. But nonetheless, Jets going Brock Bowers here. And now at pick number 11. And actually— Did you keep track? It's, it's the Falcons now. Exactly. I mean, again, this like just said earlier, you know, these picks have just been flying everywhere. So the, so the Falcons are picking at number 11 here. And now that we're out of the top 10, we'll start to kind of go through these picks a little bit more uh, faster here. Not, not, not saying that there's, you know, not a whole heck of a lot of talent left on the board because lord knows there is this is a stacked class but just because we're out of the top 10 let's go through these a little bit more faster so at number 11 the falcons after all this madness what do they do well they got in a new head coach in raheem morris who uh did a lot of uh who was a great defensive coordinator in Los Angeles, did a lot of dropping his edge rushers into coverage. And there hasn't been a defensive player picked yet. The Falcons kind of get their pick of the litter with an edge rusher here. So they're going to go with Liatu Latu out of UCLA. Had to medically retire, which is a little scary, but this is an athletic just a winner. You know, he he, he wins at, in the pass rush. He has great movement with his hands and his lower half. But this is also an athletic freak. He had two picks this season. He can drop into coverage, and he can really bamboozle some of these kind of inexperienced quarterbacks or gunslingers in the NFC South. He's a weapon that you can use. You can pair with Arnold Abichetti and, you know, get as much as you can out of Grady Jarrett. You have a pretty enticing pass rush for the future if you're Atlanta with still some problems in the secondary and on offense. I, I like the Latu pick. Even though he might not be the best edge rusher, I think he's the best fit for Atlanta, and I think he'll make an impact right away. Oh, I, I completely understand what you're saying. You know, even though sometimes it might seem, well, oh, this prospect is on the board. Why aren't you picking him? But does he fit the team's needs? So due to that, Jish Sikulski has Layatu Latu being the first defensive player off the board. And now the Broncos, who, again, very interesting situation. Do they feel the need to rush and get a QB now, or do they go somewhere different? They want a quarterback. They want a quarterback. They just traded for Zach Wilson. He's not the answer. No, he no, is he's obviously not. not the answer. But any quarterback they get at this value just probably isn't going to be it. They're hitting the phone lines as well. They're going to try and trade back, and they will. There's a certain team from a certain city that starts with a P, ends Ooh. with an A, and has Hidelfi in the middle. 
that this is this is really a homerish pick almost because I'm an Eagles fan. Obviously, this is something I would love to happen. But Howie Roseman's always going to look for avenues to make his team better. He's going to be aggressive about it, and he's going to call the Broncos, and he's going to move up to pick number twelve. The Philadelphia Eagles are on the clock, and they're going to take Terrian Arnold, wow. the cornerback from Alabama. This is something I don't think will ever happen. Right. Let's let's put this out of the way right now. Howie Roseman has never, like ever, drafted a corner in the first round. It's always the trenches, and I definitely see a reality, and I would be very, very content if they get one of these top-tier offensive linemen. But you look at a guy like Terry and Arnold. He could play on the outside or the inside. Darius Slay and James Bradbury are on the wrong side of 30. The depth, you really, really have to hope they figure it out. Keely Ringo is promising. Isaiah Rogers just got reinstated. Hopefully he has another good year after not playing for a season. But you want to hammer that depth so it's not an issue in the future. Even if Terry on Arnold doesn't start day one, which I think he could over James Bradbury, the what, what based on what he was showing on tape in the last few games of 2023, you could throw him in the slot, have him compete with Avante Maddox for those for those um, snaps there, and have him be a focal point for your defense moving forward. An SEC defender, how can Howie Roseman say no? He's sitting right there. He he potentially is a top ten talent. You get him at twelve, you give up one of your two second round picks to do it. I like it for the Eagles. Oh, that is a 1,000% perfect fit for the Eagles at this moment, getting one of the most physical corners in this draft in, again, I mean, we, we are deep on all positions, but even in corner. The best thing, Ricky, he can tackle. Oh, yeah. He can oh. Ta- The reason the Eagles lost to the Bucks in the playoffs last year is because everybody in the defense was generally disinterested in tackling. You bring back C.J. Gardner-Johnson, you extend Reed Blankenship, this is a defense that's going to tackle now. And Terry and Arnold, he's a tackler. Let me tell you that, Ricky. Yes. He will come and he's going to tackle. Thank goodness. Yes, sir. Like I just talked about, one of the most physical corners in this class. So the Eagles are going to go with Terry and Arnold. And now we're at a Raiders team that... Uh, again, I, I really feel like there's multiple directions they could go here. They could, you know, try to find Devontae Adams' replacement. They could try to, you know, fortify the trenches somehow, some way. But in your mind, what do they do? When you doubt, Ricky, you go to the trenches. When, you tr- when you're trying to build a team and build a culture, you start on the offensive and defensive line. Antonio Pierce, the interim head coach, a player favorite, he's going to bring in one of those hog mollies to shore up that right tackle spot. They got Thayer Munford starting at it right now like when was the last time you heard about him so they're gonna bring in Talise Fuaga Ooh, the Talise Oregon Fuaga. yes wow. the Oregon State offensive tackle yes sir he can play guard day one he can play tackle day one even that with a little bit of success I think he's just a mauler he's somebody with all the physical tools he's huge someone who's gonna make your team a lot better right away and you know see what you got with Aiden O'Connell he might not be the answer but you'll never know if you don't give him that shot and who knows maybe next year they'll be competing for whoever the top quarterback may end up being like a a Quinn Ewers or, or or yeah Shador Sanders something like that they, they'll, they'll have the, the real estate to do it next year, and they'll have a young, good offensive line with Colton Miller and Talise Fuaga leading the way into the future. Oh, for sure. Those are two solid tackles that the Raiders could have anchoring down their O-line. So the Raiders are going to go with Talise Fuaga at 13. And now number 14, we have the Chicago Bears after some more. I mean, we talked about all the madness before. You, you can go back and replay it if you want. But the Bears now at number 14. What are they going to do with this pick? They're going to throw a parade for Ryan Poles if he pulls this off. You get a lot of midday, uh, mid, mid-draft capital, and you get arguably the best defensive player in the draft in Dallas Turner, wow. the edge rusher from Alabama at pick 14. Wow. Players slide. Things happen. Things move all over the board. And I think Chicago is going to be the beneficiary of it this year. Dallas Turner, what can you say? I mean, he's an Alabama edge rusher. You don't want to judge the helmet, but he's just like Will Anderson before him and so many other talented SEC edge rushers. It's almost a sure thing when you take Dallas Turner. They have a big need there, too. That's probably one of their only missing pieces. The Bears can, you know, year one of this turnaround could really start shocking some people if this is what they walk out of the first round with. Oh, most definitely. I mean, getting a gem on offense and defense would be every Bears fan's dream. So the Bears go with Dallas Turner, who would add major, major impact to the Chicago defense. And now number 15, right in the middle of this first round, we have the Indianapolis Colts, who... 
are still waiting the return of Anthony Richardson, who just got Michael Pittman back yes. now with some of these recent moves. I mean, and, and obviously, you know, they have Mr. Reliable himself, Quint, <laughs> Quentin Nelson. So now in this current position, what do they do? I, I, I've i loved this pick that I'm about to make for the entire draft process. They're going to their backyard to the Mac country to get corner Quinion Mitchell wow. from Toledo arguably cornerback one in this draft. The Colts have a dire need at corner, and I think this is great value for him at pick 15 as well. He's a, a fluid <clears throat> athlete, not unafraid to play the ball, and they've had a, a deep need at that secondary. They got Juju Brents in the second round last year, a very good pick. He's kind of that bigger, more cover three, lanky kind of corner. I think Quinion Mitchell could go man-to-man with a lot of NFL talent wide receiver. We saw it in the... the uh, a senior bowl earlier this offseason. Quinion Mitchell was the player to watch, and I think he will have a very long and successful NFL career, especially if he goes to a place like Indy, who are really great at retaining their own. I think uh, he's going to be a 10-year starter in the league at least, and he'll make some Pro Bowls. Wow. Wow. That is some really high praise for Quinion Mitchell, who, like just just said, could be DB1 in this class if teams are really feeling that way. And now we shift things from the Colts over to the Seahawks, who are about to be at the end of their Geno Smith tenure. Uh, you know, they, they still have Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. You know, they still got their Kenneth Walker. Obviously, they got, you know, on over on the defensive side, you got Devon Witherspoon. But, I mean, and again, this is a situation where the Seahawks probably should start thinking about their somewhat immediate-term future after Geno Smith. When in doubt, Go to the trenches, Ricky. Wow. That's exactly what they're going to do again. They're going to get the hometown kid. They're going to get Troy Fatnew, F- Fatnew excuse me, from the University of Washington, a team that just made it all the way to the national championship. And I think they're going to throw him at guard day one. I think that he projects really well as a guard. He's got the size for it, 6'3", 320 pounds. He's a guy that can win with his explosiveness and that's exactly what they're going to need to pave some holes for Kenneth Walker and to make some room for Geno Smith. And when his time does come, I think that Seattle becomes an alluring place for a quarterback, whether you know Sam Howell steps up next year and takes it over, or if they do go with a rookie next time around. What Seattle needs to do, Geno Smith is the perfect stopgap quarterback. We've been saying this for three years now. Seattle's done a good job building the team around him. Now, next year... You're gonna bring in another. You're gonna bring in an explosive quarterback. In theory, he's gonna have the offensive line. He's gonna have the weapons. He's gonna have a, a great place to succeed if they draft Troy Fontenot. Oh, definitely. Like just just said, when in doubt, go in the trenches. So the Seahawks get Troy Fontenot at 16, and now we're gonna go through a. This is back to back cats we have here: Jaguars and Bengals. So at these picks, as the as the first round keeps going, what's happening here? I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel with this. Jaguars need a corner. They just lost Darius Williams this offseason. Nate Wiggins might be one of the best corners in this draft coverage-wise. His tackling's a little iffy, which is why I don't want him for the Eagles. But if you're if you're the Jaguars and you need to start contending uh, again with uh, the Michael Pittmans in the AFC South and the DeAndre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley, who just jumped ship to a rival, you know, you need to play against C.J. Stroud. The defense was the weakness of this Jags team. It was a big reason they collapsed late in the year. Nate Wiggins comes in. He can be a day-one starter, and he can make an impact right away oh definitely i mean and that's so crazy because the the jaguars only won one of their last eight games or whatever it was it was just, i mean it was absurd what happened to them i mean i, I just i really don't know what happened it but happened to the titans the year before too there must be something in the water in the afc south down there pro- probably i mean it, it has yet to be a true powerhouse division in the nfl in quite in, in quite some years so it's looking up though it, it definitely oh, is looking up oh, I, I like the afc south in this in the 2024 Oh, oh, I mean, definitely. You have three star young quarterbacks in the AFC South, so very interesting stuff. You could argue four. Will Levis, hey, he's still got some sky-high potential. He made some wow throws. The Fountain of Youth has, as of right now, blessed the AFC South with some QBs, but as far as the Jaguars go in this draft, they're going to go with DB at number 17. And now, like we just talked about, back-to-back cat picks with the Cincinnati Bengals, who, unfortunately... Their quarterback got hurt last year. You know, Jamar Chase still produced a thousand despite all that happened. Um, you know, T. Higgins is in his situation at the moment. Uh, you know, they have two monsters at tackle, though. I will say that. Uh, however, I mean, I, I, I'm having trouble deciding what is the, you know, definitive 
right thing for them to do at this situation. When in doubt, go to the trenches, but on the defensive side. Ooh. Byron Murphy the second, the defensive wow. oh, tackle wow. from yeah. Texas, is going to be a Cincinnati Bengal. It's not a sexy pick by any means, but this is a guy who just wins on the interior. He's going to add an extra gear to that pass rush that kind of stagnated a little bit. This is a Bengals team that really doesn't have a lot of needs. They missed the playoffs really because Joe Burrow got hurt, but they were still a quality team down the stretch with Jake Browning manning the ship. So you want to shore up that defense so teams don't run all over you, but also so you can get that interior edge that they really haven't had since they had Geno Atkins in his prime a few years ago. So Byron Murphy gives the Bengals that edge, and that's who they take at pick 18. It's a good pick. Oh, for sure. I mean, and it's actually, like you just talked about, bringing a similar culture to the Bengals, similar to Geno Atkins. So the Bengals are going to go with Byron Murphy, the second, out of Texas. But now, at number 19, the Rams, who, I mean, just lost one of the three best Arguably one of the three best defensive players to ever play this game. Um, you know, Stafford's aging. Uh, Puka showed out last year, which is obviously a bright side. Um, you know, Kyron Williams looks up, potentially. Uh, I don't know if, if he maintains that, that same, that same uh, you know, fire and, and that same productivity. However, uh, and especially since they're picking 19 and not like 8, what do they do? Well, they're not picking 19. Spoiler alert. We've got a team that's itching to move up that's been kind of lurking a little bit. Nobody quite knows what they've been doing this offseason. Some questionable moves, to say the least. They're kind of dumping all their old talent, all their defensive talent. But the Buffalo Bills are going to move up to pick number 19 to take a wide receiver to replace Stephon Diggs. And that wide receiver is Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. The deep threat, the burner that can, one of the only receivers in this draft that can keep up with Josh Allen's gigantic arm. So they're going to be aggressive and they're going to leapfrog the Steelers and the Dolphins and the Broncos who are coming up who also could use a wide receiver. Brian Thomas slots in immediately as your wide receiver one. And honestly, I think he could be one of the most successful receivers out of the gate of this draft, just considering who's going to be throwing him the ball and who else he really can throw to. Brian Thomas is going to be a field stretcher while Kincaid and Knox work underneath. The Bills' offense doesn't really lose a step. They retool, and they still look as scary as ever, and the Bills can still compete in the AFC East. For sure. I mean, we saw how tough it was last year for them. Um, you know, ha- having to come all the way back to take the two seed and at 19, the Bills trading up to get Brian Thomas, who, like you just talked about, a crazy combination of size and speed out of LSU, led college football in receiving touchdowns last year. So the Bills go with Brian Thomas at 19, and now the Steelers, who, you know, I was hoping would be able to get Brian Thomas at this mm-hmm. pick, but unfortunately they're not. Yep. Uh, you know, I was also considering a late QB pick, but in just Sikolsky's mind. See, that's that's the beauty of the NFL draft. It's like chess. Like I said, the Bills kind of know, okay, the Steelers just shipped off Deontay Johnson. They could want a receiver. We want our guy. We're going to go take him. So the Steelers are sitting here at 20, kind of in limbo. They don't really know what to do. They tried to trade back. There's nobody really realistic that's going to jump up. Like, who are you trading up for? So the Steelers are going to stay put, and they're going to take somebody who can be a hallmark of the offensive line for years to come. You're going to have Jackson Powers Johnson, the center from Oregon, snapping the football for 15 years, right? I mean, you need a good center, somebody who's a leader on that offensive line, someone who can run block and keep your quarterback clean. You just brought in two quarterbacks this offseason, who who knows what they're going to be at this point in their careers, their respective careers, but what you don't want them doing is running for their lives, which is what Russ did in Denver, which is what Justin Fields did in Chicago. So you want to make sure they have clean pockets to throw from, and Jackson Powers Johnson it might be the missing piece after they brought in Broderick Jones last year. You know, James Daniels has done what he's done, and I, I mean, I think that you Jackson Powers Johnson is just one of those guys you get at 20, like a Frank Ragnow. That's what he reminds me of at this point of the draft a few years ago. And he's just going to come and he's going to succeed. Oh, for sure. I mean, you, you could never, ever not have a good enough center because obviously that relationship with the quarterback is important. And, of course, him fortifying the trenches is, is also important. So Steelers are going to go with Jackson Powers Johnson to fortify their trenches. And now... For these next five picks, a whole lot of 
good teams, but not the best teams. So what's going to happen throughout these next, you know, five, six set of picks here? Miami, one in doubt. Go to the trenches. Wow. J.C. Latham, the tackle from Alabama, is staring smart them picks. right in the face. Smart pick. I think it's a very smart pick for them. Ter- um, Teron Armstead, their franchise left tackle, he's getting up there in years. His health has been absolutely atrocious ever since they've gotten him. So J.C. Latham is your emergency backup left tackle, and I think he comes in, he could be a guard right away. This is These are the kinds of O-linemen that the Miami Dolphins love drafting. The tackles that can swing in at guard, the guards that can swing in at center. They just lost Robert Hunt this offseason, so you do have kind of a vacancy at that guard slot that I think J.C. Latham could fill immediately. And then when, you know, you you have your injuries to Ter- Teron uh, Armstead, you can swing J.C. Latham out wide. You can bring in Jack Driscoll, your depth O-lineman that you got this offseason, to come fill in that guard spot. Whatever you need to do, the Dolphins love their moving pieces. J.C. Latham, he's a little bit of a project. There's a lot to learn, but I think that he... Uh, playing under Nick Saban at Alabama, he became a sponge. He was a day one starter there. He could be a day one starter in Miami, and I think that's why the Dolphins will be attracted to Latham at pick 21. Definitely a smart pick for Miami, and again, part of a crazy stacked offensive line class. So the Dolphins are fortifying the trenches at 21 by getting J.C. Latham, and now at pick 22 is another team that likes to fortify their trenches in the draft. That is the Eagles, but... It's the Broncos traded down. Oh, that is true. That is true. Eagles got Terry on Arnold. That is true. The Eagles did trade up. So this is the Broncos pick. What's happening? The Broncos are getting a quarterback. They're wow. getting they're getting their guy that wow. they wanted that they couldn't get at twelve because it would be a little too rich. It's Bo Nix. Oh, nice, nice. Bo, Bo nice. Nix is tall. He's accurate. He's a leader. His numbers have been great. He's an uh, incredible decision maker. These are the kinds of traits that uh, Sean Payton is going to want in his quarterback. The opposite of what Zach Wilson is, is what Bo Nix. Although Bo Nix might be older, and that's a big reason why he's falling. If Bo Nix didn't break out so late after he transferred to Oregon and played two years there for his graduate uh, graduate years, Bo Nix is probably a top 10 pick in this draft. He's got the talent for it, but you just don't know if he's reached his ceiling yet. I think the Broncos have a talented enough roster where Bo Nix can kind of make the pieces that they have work. They'll still have to continue to build around him, but that's why you trade back. You get that trade capital. You can start grabbing more pieces and building that offense the way Sean Payton really wants. And we can start seeing what a Sean Payton, not a Nathaniel Hackett offense is going to look like with Bo Nix at the helm. For sure. I mean, obviously, you know, Nix, like you said, is, is going to be one of those guys that, you know, I mean, I won't say he's a, he's a project, but he's a process. We'll call him a process for Denver. So that's going to happen at pick 22 in Jish Sikorsky's mock draft. And now pick 23, Jacksonville Jaguars via a trade. It's, it's not. It's the uh, Cardinals, actually. Okay, so we have, yes, that is correct. It, obviously, you know, like, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot say it enough, but there is so much madness. So many trades, yeah, so, 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 I don't blame you. No, hey, but uh, honestly, it's fine because, because we all know that realistically that happens on draft day in real life, so you got to make it happen in your own mock draft. So at 23, the Cardinals after, again, a whole lot of madness, what happens after they trade back? The Cardinals got this pick 23 from their trade with the Vikings, uh, and uh, they're licking their chops because arguably, again, one of the best edge rushers in this draft, Jared Verse from at Florida State, is available crazy. at 23. I think he's probably going to go earlier, but the way this board shapes out, you know, maybe the Bengals take him. I don't know. They went edge rusher last year in the first round. The Cardinals are thanking their lucky stars that Jared Verse is in their laps at pick 23. He comes in. He starts. He could win defensive rookie of the year in that Jonathan Gannon system. He's going to be great there. You know, people kind of knock him for he being, him being like kind of a hand in the dirt only kind of defensive end. I disagree. I think he can be like that Josh Sweat that uh, Gannon had in Philadelphia. He's going to produce. I think uh, this is these are two great picks for Arizona to really start building and uh, and building for the future uh, around Kyler Murray still. Almost definitely. You get one on each side of the ball. So the Cardinals are going to go with one of, if not the best edge rusher in this class, that being the uber-athletic Jared Verse. And now we have a whole lot of teams from last year's playoffs that are picking to round out the draft, beginning with the, the worst one. <laughs> We're beginning with the worst one. Beginning with the annual frauds, the Dallas Cowboys. The annual, I love that. That it's, has a ring to it. It's unfortunate, but it happens every single year. Um, just lost to the Packers, so that happened. Uh, but at pick 24, 
I have no words to describe what happened last year in the playoffs. So what happens now? How, I mean, how, how do they even go forward? Awesome, amazing, incredible. Those are the words I would use to describe what happened to the Cowboys in last year's playoffs. <laughs> You know, there's so many teams that need a quarterback next year in this year's draft, and the Cowboys are going to be one of them. I think they're moving on from Dak Prescott sooner than later. And what you do when you have like that kind of limbo period, you want to make your pocket as alluring as possible for young quarterbacks. They did this a few years ago when they drafted Tyler Smith, the guard, the tackle slash guard from Tulsa, who was a project and a half at that point. He's turned out very, very well. He's a starter, Pro Bowl-level talent for the Cowboys, and they're going to do it again with Amarius Mims from Georgia. He hasn't played a lot in college, only, I think, like 18 games in his entire career at eight Georgia. Starts, eight starts, yeah. Eight starts, but the tape doesn't lie. His pass blocking is phenomenal. He makes some juvenile mistakes. You know, he's a little bit of a bender, but... If they develop Tyler Smith from somebody who should have been a third-round pick into this perennial Pro Bowl talent, I th- believe that the Cowboys can do the same with Amarius Mims. They just lost Tyron Smith this offseason. It's, you know, you don't want to draft for need this late in the draft, but I do also think he's probably the best player available that they could select. So Amarius Mims, you're going to Dallas, and you're going to try and maintain the uh, strong tradition of uh, strong offensive lines that Dallas has boasted about for so many years. Oh, you just took the words right out of my mouth. Not only is Marius Mims a part of this stacked O-line class, a part of the deep history of Cowboys offensive linemen, so Mims goes to the Cowboys, and now we have the team that beat the Cowboys at pick 25, that being the Green Bay Packers. How do they continue to build on the what we saw as the surge of Jordan Love? I love their offense. I'm not going to touch it, although I think that they could stand to build a little bit in the trenches in the later parts of the uh, draft. I I love hammering corner for the Packers every year. I think they can never have too much talent. And I like Kool-Aid McKinstry, best name in the draft, and one of the best corners in the draft at Alabama. He... You know, he's just a technically sound, fundamentally good corner. You don't hear about him a lot other than, you know, his name being Kool-Aid. And there's a reason for that. He's not necessarily your big playmaker. You can get that in other corners, but he's going to be a strong presence to build that secondary alongside Xavier McKinney so they can have that great lockdown defense to pair with their up-and-coming fast offense. You just said it better than I could have. He is arguably, like, I mean, I I don't know if this is a crazy analogy, but he's like the Drake May of the corners in this class where, you know, like it's not that you know what you're getting, but you're just getting a a really solid, solid, solid pick. And that's all you can ask for at pick 25. Oh, definitely. And you get a somewhat pretty good value pick for Kool-Aid McKinstry at 25 for the Green Bay Packers. First time there's ever been Kool-Aid in Green Bay. This is a a real fact. Wow. That would – wow. I I did not know that. No, I just made that. Oh, it it sounded funny, right? (laughs) It it sounded good, and that's what matters. So, Kool Aid McKinstry goes to the Packers to pair alongside Jair Alexander, and now we have the Buccaneers. Who, speaking of surge, we saw the resurgence of Baker Mayfield across last season. Now, how do they hopefully? continue to build off of that following his three-year contract that he just signed. Well, I think that, you know, the, the offense is getting older, and you oh, do definitely, def- yeah. yeah, sooner rather than later, you do want to really ask yourself what's going to happen with this offense. You know, Baker Mayfield, I still am not a believer. I don't think he's the long-term answer. They, th- This is going to, in a year's time, we're going to be looking at this Baker Mayfield contract as one of the worst in the NFL. Three years, $100 million for one mediocre up-and-down year for one playoff win. Are we kidding me, Tampa Bay? Whatever. I digress. They believe in him, so I'm just going to take a backseat on this. They didn't believe in Shaq Barrett going into his thirty-two age 32 season. Let him go. Very injury prone. You know, you hate to see it, but it's probably for the better. So they're going to find his immediate replacement and at great value too. Chop Robinson, the edge rusher from Penn State. Welcome to Tampa Bay. He's going to be a solid piece alongside Joe Tryon Shoyenka if he eventually wakes up and starts playing at the level that he should have been playing at as a first rounder. I think Chop Robinson is a another great piece for this um Todd Bowles defense that builds around their edge rushers and uh, he's going to keep this Tampa Bay defense its strong suit. Well, that is that would be the hope of Tampa Bay is getting the super athletic Chop Robinson. Again, an, an, another cool name here in this NFL draft, but now at pick 27, we have the Arizona Cardinals, or no, they traded it. They traded it's it. It's the Chargers they, now, they, yes. They, yes. Yes, they traded it to the Los Angeles Chargers, so now this late in the draft, what are they doing? Uh, well, 
Jim Harbaugh has not been shy about running the ball. He had Blake Corum and Zach Charbonnet in his time at Michigan, Zach Evans as well, or Chris Evans rather, if you want to throw that in. This is this is going to be a team that wants to be multidimensional. Austin Eckler really wasn't that much of a runner. And you can't run if you don't have an offensive line. You know, it, Harbaugh has teased it at 5 Oh, maybe they go offensive line, maybe they get Joe Alt. You move all the way back in the draft after getting Roma Dunze at 8. Now you throw your running game a bone, and you go to one of the best offensive lines in college football and grab their best player in Graham Barton, the center guard from Duke. He's going to come in and he's going to move people. The reason Duke was so good at football this past season and the reason they beat Clemson week one and were ranked for quite a little bit is because they could move people off the ball. That's what Graham Barton does, plain and simple. Maybe he has some room to grow as a pass protector, but if you want to run the ball right away, you want to get Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins some running lanes, you bring in Duke's finest, and uh, perhaps even in the future, he could replace Corey Lindsley, who's getting up there in age as well. Oh, yeah, I, that is true. You know, Corey Lindsley, most likely, uh, you know, within three years from now, probably will be on his way out the door for Los Angeles. So, Graham Barton, great replacement for that. And now that just rounded out. 27 picks of this draft, and now we are at our final five. But before we get to our conference championship teams from last year, we have one of the teams that traded, that being the Rams, at 28. So what's happening here? Well, the Rams, you know, they really could do no wrong. They could honestly get depth at any position. They really overperformed last year with some of their young talent, and I think they're going to continue to grow. I love uh, Byron Young and uh, Kobe Turner on their defensive line. We'll see how they do with a new scheme, a new defensive coordinator, who I think was very paramount in their success. However, you know, I think they brought back Brandon Steele to be their DC, if I'm not mistaken. They might have not. That would, whoever they got, I think they'll still be fine. But I always, always, always am a proponent of building up that offensive line. They did it with their first pick last year with Steve Avila. A great pick. He ended up being a very solid rookie. And they're going to keep building that offensive line. This time going to the tackle spot where Tyler Guyton is sitting there. The tackle from Oklahoma. Nice. He will slot right into that Rams offensive line. Whether or not he starts day one, he will be a piece moving forward and a good one at that. Oh, most definitely. I mean, the OU tackle, like you just talked about, one of the best in this super stacked O-line class. So the Rams go with Tyler Guyton. And now, like we just talked about, our four conference championship teams, beginning with arguably the winners of last year's draft, that being the Lions. And they might be the winners of this year's draft if this is how the board shapes out and this is who falls into their lap. Cooper DeGene, the defensive back from Iowa. And I say defensive back because with his kind of versatility and athleticism, he could play safety or corner. And those are both positions of need for the Lions. I don't say he say, he plays both. He'll probably stick to playing corner, especially after the legal issues that's going on in that defensive back room and also losing C.J. Gardner-Johnson. I think Cooper DeGene is going to play outside corner for them, and I think he's going to be a really, really good corner too to start building that secondary, which kind of was their last missing piece. And I think if they get a very dangerous secondary they're going to go over the hump and uh they can start competing the nfc and cooper DeGene, he he's an athletic freak right he he'll he'll play either safety or corner but he the only thing that about him that really makes him drop is his stiffness a little bit so i, I think that'll be smoothed out in detroit and uh he doesn't have to move far from iowa to go to the motor city oh most definitely just a few hours drive from there so Cooper DeGene goes to the Lions to basically replace C.J. Gardner-Johnson and fill some of those other holes that Detroit has. So now we're going to move on to number 30 here. Last three picks of the draft, beginning with the Baltimore Ravens, who, you know, like you talked about, got Derrick Henry in the offseason, just came off of, uh, you know, a, a phenomenal year after having the number one overall record in the NFL. So if they want to get back to a similar position, uh, you know, of this past postseason what do they have to do this is one of the most complete rosters in the nfl they added king henry they look at the board right now nobody really stands out to them nobody's jumping off the page like hey we need this guy on our team right now if i'm the ravens i'm hitting the phone lines and that's exactly what they do and uh (laughs) there's a certain quarterback that's still on the board from the university of washington named michael Penix jr has an injury history, has, you know, only like two really good years of production. But he's right there. And 
I think he still is a first-round talent thanks to that beautiful deep ball. And one team in this draft really got a beautiful deep ball threat in Malik Neighbors. The New York Giants jump back up into the first round at pick number 30, and they get potentially their quarterback for the future. Move over, Drew Locke. Move over, Tommy DeVito. And move over, Daniel Jones. Michael Penix Jr. from Washington goes to New York, and he is going to be the quarterback of the future. He's a little bit older, but this is a guy who can win you football games. He brought Washington to the national championship. The the prettiest deep ball you've ever seen as a lefty quarterback. He's got a little bit of mobility to him as well. The durability is an issue, but he won't have to be thrown into the fire right away. And I like this Giants offensive line a little bit more than I did last year. I think they're growing even more. Andrew Thomas, Evan Neal is going to take a step forward. You would hope if you're a Giants fan, they step up, they take Michael Penix, they take that big swing and hopefully they hit a home run. Wow. I mean, talk about value for the New York Giants if they can pull this off and get Michael Penix to essentially at some point replace Daniel Jones. So the Giants are going to go with the Washington quarterback. And now we have our Super Bowl teams, the 49ers and the Chiefs, obviously two of the best teams with two of the best rosters in the NFL. So if both of them want to get back to the Super Bowl, I mean, and obviously that's what every team wants to do is get to the Super Bowl. But if they want to get back to the Super Bowl, what are they well, the, the 49ers, they're always a weird drafting team. They never do what anybody expects them to do. They, they're, they're, they throw picks around willy-nilly. Some of them hit, some of them miss. Um, so they're going to take this guy at 31 who probably shouldn't be a first-round pick, but he's going to be. It's Christian Haynes, the guard from UConn. He, he's really a guard only, which does plummet his stock a little bit, but he's a dang good guard at that. Six foot four, great size. They really don't have an interior offensive line, and you could argue with Christian McCaffrey, they don't really need that, and there's much more dire needs. But Kyle Shanahan doesn't care about what you say. Kyle Shanahan's going to do what he wants to do. I think Christian Haynes is athletic enough to get those reach blocks and, the, and, and execute the zone running system that San Francisco has done to perfection. And he, the draft really doesn't matter to San Francisco. They can pick Garrett Schrader here, and it would be a fine pick for them. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, w- with the roster that they have and the season that they just had, I mean, they could do whatever they want, and, and, and nobody would really bat an eye. So apparently in Jish Sokolsky's mock draft, they're going to go with Christian Haynes out of UConn at 31, and now rounding out the first round is the Kansas City Chiefs, who, I mean, back-to-back championships, now what? Who would have thought they would have been there, man? It, midway through, like, November, when you look at the Chiefs, their wide receivers can't catch a cold. The Patrick Mahomes is getting frustrated at the refs and the media. There's no way the Chiefs make it back. They made it back and they won it all again. But that doesn't mean there weren't cracks in the armor along the way and really, really big needs that they have to fix. It's shocking because out of the past like three teams, the Ravens, the 49ers, the Lions, the Chiefs are the most incomplete team, especially with Rasheed Rice's now legal issues that were, oh, oh my God, what are, what are you doing, man? Right. The, the the Chiefs, let's stop beating around the bush. They need a wide receiver. Oh, yeah. They brought in Marquise Brown, which is a great start this offseason. A great start bringing in Marquise Brown. But they kind of need that physical head tap, going to moss you type of receiver. So they bring in Adonai Mitchell. Wow. Georgia transfer via Texas, the wide receiver. He's going to come in, and he's going to battle with corners on the outside. He's going to be a throw it up there for Tra- for um, excuse me, for Patrick Mahomes when Travis Kelsey gets doubled, and if Marquise Brown, you know, isn't running a deep route. I think A.D. Mitchell provides this offense with a little bit more versatility. You have the speed, you have the hands with Kelsey, you have the speed with Brown. Now you just add the toughness, the meanness with Adonai Mitchell, who was a big reason why Texas also made it to the college football playoffs this past season the rich get richer Adonai Mitchell joins the Kansas City Chiefs and he's going to win a Super Bowl wow I mean if, if they do go back to back to back that would be in it might not be this year but they're going to win another one. Oh well oh for, for sure but if they do go back to back to back that would be absolutely insane and we would witness even more history from Kansas City so they go with the deep threat that is Adonai Mitchell at Pick 32, and so now before I let you go here, I got to ask, you know, are there any, you know, last remarks, last thoughts, you know, overall predictions that you might have for this draft? 
you watch the draft on day one, but you stay watching the draft day two and day three for good reason. There's a lot of talent that didn't get selected in this first round. Johnny Newton, the D-tackle from Illinois, is a name that comes to mind. Jordan Morgan, a tackle from Arizona, is going to be a great player in the NFL. So keep watching the draft. Everything I said, it's going to be 100% right, don't get me wrong. But if it isn't, you have to watch the draft to find out. Oh, 1,000%. And, I mean, like you just talked about, when you have a class as good as this, you can't help but even, you know, just bring your— I mean, as, as tempting as it is to not watch rounds two and three, I mean, we, we've we seen in the past that there's been some crazy picks from these mid-rounds. So The rookie of the year, Puka Nakua, or, well, almost rookie of the year, Puka Nakua, was a fifth-round pick. Yeah, I mean, and, and that just goes to show that, you know— when it, when it comes to drafting, you know, n- not only are is it somewhat of a gamble, but not only do you have to capitalize on your first round picks, but you also got to capitalize on those mid round picks because you never know what gems you can find in the NFL draft. So I think that is going to do it for this episode of Stir the Pods. Thank you, Jish, so much for, for coming back on the program and helping support it, man. You know, it, it really does mean a lot for you to take the time and, and run it back and do yet another mock draft for Stir the Pots. You know, I had a, I had a whole lot of fun analyzing this with you, and uh, I mean, I'm just so excited for Thursday night to watch this draft. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be historic. Madness will happen. So thank you so much for coming on the program, and of course, thank you to the listeners for tuning in, uh, you know, every single week and supporting the, the podcast. Um, you know, just I, I really can't uh, ex- express, you know, what it means to – be, be able to do this kind of stuff, you know, almost, on an almost every single day basis. And, you know, it's just it's awesome to be able to talk sports because, uh, you know, s- sports are fun and sports brings people together. So thank you all so much for tuning in. And, of course, to anybody that has, uh, you know, helped me get to where I am today. Uh, I just I, I'm always going to be eternally grateful for you all uh, for helping me get to this position that I am. Uh, you know, it's, it's very humbling to, you know, have have the life that I do uh, and to hopefully, you know, make this business, uh, you know, my living in the future. So hopefully we can keep bringing you some A grade content in the future and we'll see you all next week for episode 58. Thank you.